Good morning. Welcome to Clemson Presbyterian Church. My name is Matthew Eichard, and I have the great privilege of serving as one of the pastors here at Clemson Pres. We are delighted that you are here with us this morning, and we are thankful that God has drawn us together from our homes here in this community for the purpose of worship this morning. Before we enter into worship in just a few moments by reading our call to worship together, there are just a few announcements that I want to make sure we're all aware of. Uh, first, if you are newer to our congregation, or perhaps you would like to become even more well-connected uh, to just the things that are happening here in the life of our church, I would encourage you to visit our website, clemsonprez.org slash contact. Um, you can go there and uh, give us your information so that you start receiving emails and, and so you can stay up to date really on what we're doing, not only here on Sunday mornings, but throughout the week as we seek to live life together as a community of God's people. The other announcement that I want to make sure we're aware of today is that if you have children in nursery or in our elementary ministry or in youth ministry, middle school and high school, this Wednesday night at 6 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall, we're having a meeting for all of the parents of students. Again, nursery, elementary age, and middle and high school age students. And uh, this is an opportunity for us to really just be reminded of why we do what we do, of how we come alongside each other as a church and as families, uh, to love coming generations of God's people, to lead them well. So I'd encourage you to be there. I will say this, there will be child care uh, for our nursery age children, and in addition to our midweek for elementary and D groups for our youth. So uh, parents, again, please join us. If you have any questions, you can see me and, and we'll talk about it. But that's this Wednesday, October 19th at 6 p.m. With these things in mind, let us again remember that God has drawn us together from our homes in the midst of everyday life. For some of us this morning, that brings a lot of joy. For some of us, we may be carrying very real burdens and sorrows. Some of us may be on cloud nine, and some of us may be in a very real sense in the valley. The good news is that our triune God not only knows where we are, but meets us where we are for his glory and for our good. Knowing that our God loves us, and that our God welcomes us in his presence by the power of Jesus Christ and through his spirit. Let us stand together now as God himself calls us to worship with <clears throat> Psalm 47. Please read this with me. Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our King, sing praises. For God is the king of all the earth. Sing praises with a psalm. God reigns over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we are thankful this morning on this beautiful fall day that you are seated on the throne of eternity. God, we thank you that you are the great King of all kings and the Lord of lords. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have entrusted the scepter and the rod to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that his kingdom is expanding throughout all time and history, throughout all nations. God, we thank you that we, as your people, can live in confidence, knowing that every moment of our lives you are present, you are caring, you are leading, you are guiding. God, I pray this morning that we would worship you in spirit and in truth, that we would worship you knowing that you are sovereign and that in that sovereignty you are personally involved. God, I pray this morning that you would encourage those who are downtrodden, bring clarity to those who are confused. Lord, I pray that you would bolster the heart that is rejoicing, 
and that God ultimately we would find our purpose, our hope, our joy, and even life itself, not in our circumstances, but in you. We pray all these things in the strong name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us remain standing together as we sing our hymns of praise, all hail the power of Jesus' name and ancient of days.
seated. As we continue in worship together, you may have noticed that in your bulletin we come now to the confession of sin. We've just taken a moment, actually several moments, to consider together God's kingly office, that he is enthroned in heaven, that he is in fact the ancient of days, that he is righteous and holy. And if we're being honest, we have to admit that in daily life, we are not. Yes, we stand clothed as God's people in the righteousness of Christ. And yet we continue in our words, in our thoughts, our motivations, and our actions to be a sinful people. There's something I think intimidating, is there not, about confessing our sin, even publicly together in a written prayer. It's intimidating as we often want to save face before other people. Perhaps even more intimidating as we approach a holy God. But I think we have good reason to be confident not only in the finished work of Jesus Christ, but in the testimony of David, who wrote these words from Psalm 51. David is described as a man after God's own heart. And yet we know, if we are familiar with the story of Scripture, that Psalm 51 was actually something that followed on the heels of David's adulterous affair with Bathsheba and the murder of Bathsheba's wife, Uriah. And yet what does David say? O oh God, according to your steadfast love. David recognizes that our God is not in fact fickle. And that his forgiveness of our sins is not predicated upon our righteousness or our faithfulness, but his. And so even now as we come to confess our sin, I would encourage you to come honestly in a contrite spirit, but in confidence that God loves us and that in Jesus Christ, God forgives us and cleanses us. Let us pray this together from Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Will you take a few moments now to silently confess your sin before our God through the merits of Jesus Christ?
Amen. Hear now the assurance of forgiveness and pardoning grace taken from Ephesians chapter 2. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. In this confidence, let us stand together and sing our song of assurance, All I Have is Christ.
seated. As we continue to worship together, many of you may know that from time to time we have an opportunity to hear about God's work both here in our local church and the efforts that God is calling us to in our community and even throughout the world. One of our core values is to be outwardly focused, reflecting God's heart for the nations. This morning, we're going to have an opportunity to hear from Ron Spohr uh, concerning some crates that we packed here as a church and that he has recently delivered on our behalf to Ukraine. So, Ron, please come. Good morning. Uh, my name is Ron Spohr. I'm a member of the Outreach Committee here at Clemson Prez. And uh, as was just stated, we, uh, our church recently actively participated and supported a mission project regarding humanitarian aid for Ukraine. Um, go ahead and show the first slide, if you would. Uh, I was asked to share a little feedback about that project and how it went. I would say uh, the short answer is that God is great and he answers prayer. It was just really awesome to see the many ways that God's hand was on this project as we uh, went through the various steps of what was going on. Uh, the folks at MTW, Missions to the World, our missionary uh, arm, prayed for uh, ways to help the people in Ukraine. And they had worked for years uh, quite closely with the uh, pastors in Ukraine. And so after, sometime after the war started, they asked these pastors what, what they really needed, how, uh, how MTW could serve them. And so the pastors put together a very specific list of medical supplies and wound care items and various things that they were in desperate need of. So, um, and, and the uh, project that came out of that was called Crates for Ukraine. And these crates were a very targeted way to get the people in Ukraine what was needed most. And uh, this was very much a family affair, as you can see, uh, with the picture of the Lewises family here and based on God's grace we attempted to fill 12 crates and God's answer to that prayer was uh, our cup was overflowing we actually um, had enough material to fill 16 crates and Bethany was able to scramble and find four more crates to pack and uh, it was just really a pretty cool event and another thing that we prayed for this next slide shows uh, we prayed for volunteers to organize all this material, uh, get it packed in the crates, and we also had to uh, document specifically what was in every single crate. And that prayer was answered. We had a good group of people that spent a Saturday doing that. Some of the crates were so full, we actually had to duct tape the seams a little bit. We were concerned the hinge was maybe going to break. <laughs> uh, next slide. We also prayed for logistics and um, Oh, this picture, this slide here shows all 16 crates packed and ready to go. Next slide. Another thing we prayed for was logistics and uh, potential for reduced uh, luggage fees. God also said yes to those prayers. The, um, we had volunteers that took us to the airport, and we also, uh, Delta allowed us to take all 16 crates for free, which was a huge blessing. When the day that uh, we arrived in Krakow, the, I talked to another couple that uh, for, from Texas that just arrived, and they paid $3,200 in luggage fees for their crates. So ours getting to go for free was a real blessing. Next slide. Uh, we also prayed that the crates would all arrive on time and be uh, undamaged. And sure enough, that answer, uh, the, the answer to that prayer was also yes. We got the crack out, and everything went really well. And the reason we went to Krakow instead of the Ukraine is um, after the war started, MTW made a decision that their people needed to evacuate. So they went to Krakow, Poland, which is very near the Ukraine border. So that's uh, the way this came about this way. Next slide. This slide shows um, the MTW person greeting us at the airport. That all went great. It was on time. And uh, on the left-hand side, that's a picture of one of the rooms at the warehouse. We hoisted all the crates from the street through that window that you see in the back of the photo. And uh, they had several rooms there that were full of crates. And on a personal note, I also prayed for some help getting around the city. 
the street names were all like 12, 10 to 12 letters long, and there'd be like one vowel. It was, I don't know how you pronounce these street names, but thankfully we were staying pretty close to where the warehouse was at, so it was pretty easy for us to walk over there each day and, and help out. Next slide. Another thing that my son Kyle and I prayed about was other things that we could do to be of assistance while we were there. And um, Kirk, who's with the MTW, who by the way went to seminary with Reed, I guess, at the same time. Uh, Kirk was approached by Tammy and, Aga and her husband Augusta. Um, who, they were there doing a documentary and they were also uh, helping with a uh, refu temporary refugee setup. And they needed some volunteers to help assemble beds and night tables and shelves and stuff like that. So we were able to help with that for a couple of days. Uh, next slide. Another thing that um, uh, happened every day was in the late afternoon or early evening, there was a peaceful demonstration in the city center. And here you see a couple of pictures of, of that. And the people that were organizing the demonstration were uh, they, they shared some of what was going on in Ukraine and in some fairly graphic detail told about some of the atrocities that were being carried out on the people of Ukraine. It was very moving and, and we understood some of this because some days parts of it were in English. A lot of times we didn't understand but we kind of, you could still feel the emotion and, and all the, uh, the, you know, the atmosphere. Next slide. This is an interactive map and I think on the, um, in the email, there's a link to this on the MPW site. And if all the pins that you see there are locations in Ukraine where the goods that you folks donated were uh, distributed to either um, a church or a hospital and it got to the people that, that needed this. Neither government, the American government nor the Ukraine government were involved with any of this. This was just MTW working with the pastors there. Next slide. Uh, this is a list of, you also have a link to this in, uh, on the website. This is some statistics regarding this, uh, this activity. It turned out that these crates were a very, uh, a very good logistical way to get the material there in a very timely way and cost-effective way. So I think this is something that MTW may do again at some point if there's a similar need. Next slide. Um, as you just heard, God answers prayer. And so we are asking you, your help once again to boldly pray for the things that are on this list uh, as the war continues. Your generous support of missionary activities like this makes it a, a true pleasure and a joy to serve on the Outreach Committee. Thanks for your time and your prayers. encouraging is it not to know that our God is in fact on the move and many times that comes through very practical aid so Ron thank you for your work and to those of you who participated in this vital work thank you for serving uh, faces and names that we may never see but we trust faces and names and eternal souls that will be touched not only by these practical goods but ultimately by the gospel of Jesus Christ this morning, we have the opportunity to recognize that our giving God calls us to be giving people in our tithes and our offerings in the giving of our time, our energies, and our gifts to the good of his kingdom. I'll remind you that this time is also the time that we dismiss our kindergartners through second graders through the library uh, for their time of engage. Now we join us during the final song. As we think about giving, um, I'm going to read a portion of scripture from Mark chapter 12 in just a moment. But let me remind you that if you are led and called to give financially to the church, you can do so by offering a physical gift in one of the boxes here at each exit, or you can continue to go online and give there as well. I encourage you to do that. Listen now to Mark chapter 12 as we consider being a giving people. And he sat down opposite the treasury and watch the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich, rich people put in large sums, and a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which make a penny. And he called his disciples to him and said to them, truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box, for they all have contributed out of their abundance 
but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. This time, Mark Dodd will come and lead us in our congregational prayer. Mark. Good morning. Before I enter our time of congregational prayer, I did want to take a personal opportunity to thank you all as a congregation for the way that you have cared for my wife Jennifer and I over the last several weeks as she received her cancer diagnosis, surgery, and a period of recovery. Your calls, texts, prayers, and meals have meant a tremendous amount to us, and we have certainly felt the love of our church family, so thank you. As we've often said in the past, as we've gone into this time of congregational prayer, this is not a time for one person to pray for our congregation alone. It's a time for us to pray together. So as I lead us in prayer, please actively come alongside me as we pray for the needs of our body. Please join me now as we pray. Father, as we come to you this morning, I personally want to praise you and thank you for the beauties of this season. You could have made the world without them but it is a joy to experience the creativity of your hand and the colors and temperature changes this fall season brings. May it cause us to praise you and honor you as we experience this time of change. Father, we think about our congregation. We pray for those who have recently experienced the destructive power of the hurricane in Ian. We pray that you'd be with those who are there who have lost loved ones and have lost physical property. We ask that, you would, that they would feel your presence and they may feel the helping hand of those alongside who bring them comfort. Father, I do thank you this morning for the way that you have cared for my family, for the expedience and good results of Jen's cancer diagnosis. And Father, we pray for her continued recovery over the next several weeks and the prayers for the years to come with no cancer. Father, we also pray this for true, it will be true for Kirkley Morrison as she recovers. May you also give her strength and encouragement to Jay and to the girls as they go through the weeks ahead. Father, we also pray for Donna Alter and ask that you would help her to heal from her hip surgery. We pray for Kent as he cares for his wife. Father, we also lift up Jackie Gambrell and Miranda Bosca as they are dealing with injuries. We pray for quick healing for them. And Lord, we pray for Bill Fisk as he prepares for surgery this Wednesday. We pray the surgeons will be successful and that Bill can recover quickly. Lord, we do know that, we don't, that you do not always work through quick healings or that we do not always get good diagnoses. We pray for endurance and strength for those who are going through extended seasons of health struggles. May they experience your presence in real and tangible ways through these difficult seasons. And we do also pray for those around the world who are experiencing hardship. And we think particularly of our brothers and sisters in Ukraine. We thank you that you allowed us as a church to be involved in your work there. We ask that you would bless the physical items that were provided in the crates that Ron and his son were able to deliver. We pray that they will be used for the good of the people in Ukraine and ultimately for your glory. And we pray this morning for our worship here. May our time together as the family of Clemson Presbyterian be glorifying to you. As your word is opened, may, we, may it work in our hearts and bring glory to you as we seek to be more like Jesus. And we ask that you'd be with Brian as he, prepare, as he brings your word to us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Morning. morning. It's great to see all of you this morning. As Mark said, my name is Brian. Uh, I'm one of the pastors here, if we've not met. And uh, I'd ask you to turn this morning in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 1 through 10. Uh, as I've gotten to know this congregation the last few months, I've noticed that the morning after a night game, there's a few more yawns as we get together. A little less energy in the room. So this morning as we read God's word, let's stand. <laughs> Get the blood flowing a little bit before we sit for another uh, chunk of time. Galatians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. This is God's word. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. I went up because of a revelation and set before them, though privately, before those who seemed to be influential, the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles, in order to make sure I was not running or had not run in vain. But even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. 
Yet because of false brothers secretly brought in who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus so that they might bring us into slavery, to them we did not yield in submission even for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. And from those who seem to be influential, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Those, I say, who seemed influential added nothing to me. On the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised, for he who worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised worked also through me for mine to the Gentiles, and when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. Only they asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much as we come to your word this morning that you are not silent. We thank you so much that you speak and you speak to us. You spoke these words thousands of years back, and yet they are here for us this morning. So please, we pray, by the power of your spirit, open up our hearts and minds to hear your truth, to receive it, to trust it, to be changed by it. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. This is our third sermon so far in this series on the New Testament letter of Galatians, and it's a book largely, we'll see as we go, about spiritual slavery and spiritual freedom. What is spiritual slavery? How can we be rescued from it? What is spiritual freedom? And finally, here in chapter 2, our third sermon, we're getting finally a look into what it is that has the author of this book, Paul, so worked up. We saw in the first chapter, he comes out of the gate charging. He's fired up because of what's happening in these churches that he had planted and then left to go start more churches. He's so fired up, he doesn't even say what it is that has him fired up. The original uh, recipients of the book knew what it was, but readers today have to wait until chapters two and three. Now, I've had to backfill so we could understand just what's going on, but he didn't even say until this chapter. The direct issue that, these, that this book really is about is about the issue of circumcision and the Old Testament law. But it's, of course, we'll see as we go about so much more than that. It's about being free, about being free from the insecurity, from the pride, from the exhausting treadmill of trying to earn your standing before God and your credibility before others. In other words, this book is about the preservation of the gospel. That's what Paul says. Not even for a moment did I yield, so the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. In our first sermon two weeks back, we talked a little bit about freedom from performance. Now this week, as Paul dives into it, I want to flesh that out a little bit more. I want us to see it even more, to understand it, to appreciate it, to live out of it, to praise God for that freedom that can come. So our first and our main point this morning is simply this, we are free. And then we'll have three smaller points that come from that. Second, so we fight. Third, so we partner. And fourth, so we remember the poor. First, we are free. If you look back with me at chapter 2, verse 1, the first verse there that we read, we see Paul picks up right where he left off last week in the section that we, that we read. He's defending himself from false attacks. Like I said, he had planted these churches in what is now modern-day Turkey. He had started them on a firm foundation, the foundation of the good news of Jesus Christ crucified and resurrected, that it is faith in that action plus absolutely nothing else that leads to salvation. But as we've said, people snuck in and they said, yes, faith in Jesus' work is great, now just add to it. Just add to it, keeping in their case, they said, the Old Testament law. That's why they were called Judaizers. They wanted to insist the Old Testament law must be kept in addition to faith in Jesus. They were saying, actually, Paul was kind of right, but listen, Paul, they said, isn't an apostle like the Jerusalem apostles. 
He's not an apostle like the others. He's kind of second rate. That's why he had it mostly right. And so now to defend his message, Paul has to defend himself. He was doing that in what we saw last week. He said, my message is from God. I didn't get it from my own creation. I didn't get it from the other apostles, though I did confirm it with them later, but I got it directly from God. He didn't even go to Jerusalem to confirm it, we read last week, for three years. And there he only met with two of the other apostles. Now he says after 14 years, chapter 2, verse 1, he goes to Jerusalem. And he takes this man named Titus with him. If you're familiar with the New Testament, there is a short letter further in called Titus that Paul wrote to this same man. Titus, as we read there, was a Greek man. He converted to Christianity through Paul's ministry. He didn't have any Jewish background. He didn't have any Jewish blood. He didn't have any um, exposure or commitment to Jewish religion. And now he's a Christian. He has trusted Jesus' work on the cross and the empty tomb for his salvation. And Paul takes Titus with him to Jerusalem to make sure that men like Peter, James, and John were on the same page with Paul. And not because Paul was unsure of his message. He's already told us, if, if someone else, even an angel, preaches to you a different gospel, don't listen. He's already told us, I got my gospel from God himself. He's not unsure of it, but he is finding that his fruitfulness, his effectiveness, is being curtailed because wherever he goes and wherever he's been, these people are coming in and saying, yes, faith, and something else. And so he has to go and kind of force the issue when he goes to Jerusalem. He, and he takes this man Titus, this Greek convert, as an object lesson. Titus, of course, because he's not Jewish, has never been circumcised. And Paul wants to leave no room for ambiguity. Will the Jewish apostles accept him or not? And if they do, then wherever Paul goes, he can say, listen, not in the abstract, but I have seen Peter James and John themselves at headquarters in Jerusalem receive a man, a believer, who is uncircumcised. He's forcing the issue. It's a bold move. And this is a time for us to stop and say, why is this even such a big deal? Why was circumcision, of all things, what this early church, these early churches in this region of Galatia, even getting hung up on? To answer that, we have to go way back in history. But hang with me, it's going to make the good news all the sweeter. We have to go back 4,000 or so years when the world was, just as it is today, a broken and messed up place. Every nation, every people, every person was broken and sinful. And into that broken and sinful mess, God comes and makes a promise to one man named Abraham. Into that broken world 4,000 years ago, God makes a promise. He makes a covenant with this one man, Abraham, who didn't know God. God comes to him and says, look, I promise, I covenant with you that I am going to make you into a great nation. I'm going to give you, one man, many descendants, even though you're old, even though your wife is the same age. I'm going to make you into a great nation, but not for your sake, not just for their sake. I'm going to do it to bless all the nations. That was the promise to Abraham. Into this broken and sinful world, Abraham, you're going to have descendants, and one descendant in particular through whom all nations, every nation on the face of the earth will be blessed. And as a mark of that promise, God said to Abraham, I'm going to give a sign to you and to your descendants to show that this promise, this covenant, is for you. I'm going to give the mark of circumcision. It'll be a sacred mark of belonging to God, a sacred mark even of this mission that he had given to his people, not just to be blessed themselves, but to be a blessing to all nations. Now, hundreds of years after that, to one of Abraham's descendants, Moses, God works, and he brings on top of that promise and covenant of Abraham of grace, he puts a promise on top of that or he puts another covenant on top of it of law. And there's many types of law that came through Moses in the Old Testament in the first five books. Some was what we call the moral law that still guides our right and wrong uh, 
thoughts of what we do today. There was the civil law, which was to govern their life as a nation. And then there was the ceremonial law. And you could say that circumcision was a part of that ceremonial law. That was a complex, if you've read the first five books of the Bible, it's a complex set of laws that the Jews, the descendants of Abraham, had to follow in order to be ceremonially clean. And they had to be ceremonially clean in order to come and worship God at the tabernacle and then the temple. It included such laws as what they could eat or not eat. They could not eat, for instance, pork. They could not wear blended fabrics. If they touched anything that was dead or diseased or in any way unclean, then they would be unclean and had to go through a purification process in order to become clean, in order to go and worship God. Why? Well, that ceremonial law was placed on top of that gracious promise to Abraham to show them something, to show them a few things, that the holy and profane cannot be mixed, that sinful people need cleansing in order to go into the presence of God, and importantly, that no one can be completely clean and acceptable to God on their own, because everybody was going to be unclean at some point. Some things that would make you unclean were sinful. They were wrong, but other things weren't necessarily sinful in and of themselves. God set up this complex system to keep them always thinking, am I clean or unclean? Am I able to go and worship God or not? Do I need to be purified before I can go? It was to teach them something. It was to teach them that we need God to do something to bring us to him. But because of the nature of it, what we see is that it couldn't ultimately do the job itself. Yes, we need God to do something to bring us to him. And here's the genius of Paul's message, and we'll see of Peter's and James and John in the New Testament and from God himself, is that that thing we need from God to come to him has been done. It has been done. It was done when Jesus died on the cross and when he raised up from the tomb once and for all. Because yes, we have to admit when we're honest with ourselves that we are sinful people. That we are sinful people. That we want to be independent and free from God. We want to set up our rules and our identities. We want to be in God's place. We worship anything and everything so often but him. We worship any way that we want. We take his name lightly, we disregard his holy day, we don't honor our authorities, we get angry, we use cutting words, we murder, we steal and don't value others and what they own, we use our bodies however we want, we lie, we're greedy, and yes, that was the Ten Commandments right there. And we break all of them, every single one, even the best of us break all of those. We're sinful, as we said last week, in our wickedness as we break those, but we're also sinful in our obedience because we do it for the wrong reasons, for selfish reasons. We are unclean and sinful before God, and we've racked up a debt to him in so doing that we can't pay. But Paul's message was Jesus paid all that debt with his righteous and perfect life for the wicked and the quote-unquote righteous. Our sins, as Acts chapter 3 says, can be blotted out. We can be forgiven. Our record of debt can be canceled, not by anything we can do because we can't. And so we don't need the law to teach us that same thing anymore because Jesus, the one to whom it pointed, has come. We can't earn God's approval. We need him to do it. That was the whole point of the ceremonial law. It was to help us see that ultimately we can't make ourselves clean before God. But the Judaizers came in and said, no, it's just the opposite. You need it to be clean before God. And Paul says, no, you missed the whole point. The one to whom it pointed has come. And so all of that has been fulfilled. They wanted to take those who were free and put them right back into bondage. Let me try to help you see how terrible this is by perhaps uh, jogging your memory with the movie Saving Private Ryan. Have you seen it? It's hard to believe it's like 25 years old now. Um, all of my movie references are old, so get used to it. 1998, probably the best war movie of all time. If you can recall it, the opening scene is an elderly man in France. He's a World War II veteran. It's 40 or 50 years after the war. He's walking through one of those iconic graveyards in France where so many Allied soldiers 
are buried, those white crosses. He's followed by his wife. He's followed by his kids. He's followed by his grandkids. And he doesn't say anything, but we can tell he's looking for something. He's looking for one of those crosses. And he finds it. And he's unsteady, he's uncertain, and he falls before it, overcome with emotion. And we're left wondering why, and the movie doesn't tell us right away, because it flashes then 40 or 50 years back to June 6, 1944, D-Day. Captain John Miller leads his company, Company C, in a breakout from the beach that day. And as they take the first hill, as they get there, they're told, you have new orders. Captain Miller is Tom Hanks' character, if you can remember. They learn that a man named Private James Francis Ryan of the 101st Airborne is missing, and he is presumed now to be the last surviving brother of four. The other three have already died in the war. And the command is, go and find him, so this family does not lose all four of their sons. And so Miller and his company follow orders. They go, and in the process, many of them lose their lives. They find Private Ryan. He can go home. But even Captain Miller gives his life. And as he expires on the bridge in a small town in France with Private Ryan standing next to him, you can tell he's near death. He pulls Private Ryan down. And with his last breath, he can barely say it. Do you remember what he says? Earn this. Earn it. And he simultaneously freed Private Ryan and put him into bondage. Because then the movie flashes back and we realize that man is the elderly Private Ryan, returned to find Captain Miller's grave. This man who rescued him, who freed him, and told him to earn it. And through tears, he looks at the grave and says to Captain Miller, I've tried to live my life the best I could. I hope it was enough. And then he looks at his wife and he says, tell me I've led a good life. Tell me I'm a good man. There he is, surrounded by a loving wife, loving children, loving grandkids. He served his country faithfully, apparently. He's been a success in life. He can bring his whole family to France. He's checked all the boxes of being a good man in some folks' eyes. And yet he's still left in bondage. Have I done enough? Am I a good man? Have I earned this man's life back? Have I earned the lives of the others who died for me? The verdict for his entire life hung in the balance as he looked at his wife and said, tell me I'm a good man. It hung there. He was back into bondage. He'd been a slave his whole life. And I think that is the perfect picture of the wrong relationship with God that so many of us live. We're told Jesus died for us, and though he never said this on the cross, we hear him saying, earn it, earn this, and keep going, keep going, do more, do more, so you can earn back what I have given you. We feel that way in our relationship with God, but the good news is nothing less than this. By faith alone, by grace alone, we are free from having to do what the law never could do. For thousands of years, the Jews tried to keep the law, but it never worked. It never was enough because it can't be enough. But through Jesus, by grace alone, we have God's smile. We have God's approval. We have his acceptance. We have right standing before him. You say, but we don't even do circumcision. How does this even apply to us? because it applies to us in every way. You don't have to add anything to what Jesus did by your own obedience. You don't have to prove yourself worthy. You don't have to be more to earn what God freely gives. And by be more, I mean you don't have to be more consistent. You don't have to be more joyful. You don't have to be more obedient. You don't have to be more studious, more hospitable, more prayerful. You don't have to be more of anything to earn what God freely gives. Because while we were yet sinners, before we were more, he loved us. All of those things can be great, and they have their place, and we should talk about them, right? But we cannot rely on them. We cannot build on them to gain a good standing before God. It is freely, completely, and totally given. God loves you in Christ whether or not you have your devotions. 
He loves you in Christ whether or not you give enough, whether or not you're cleaned up, your theology is perfect, or your family is a mess. God loves you in Christ. One man I read this week said, Jesus has won the gold medal and given it to us. Don't go and dip it in bronze. And I would say, bronze? Yeah, more like last place. That's what I would dip it in, all the way back at the back of the pack. I, I did not finish a DNF. I can't even finish the race. If we can't gain God's approval through the Old Testament law, don't think some rule you make up for yourself and everybody else is going to be enough either. So often we can look at ourselves when we're doing better in some area of our life and think, man, this must sound like a symphony to God. I'm killing it with my devotions for two whole straight days. He must be so impressed. I've given for the first time it sounds like a symphony to God. With my theology, I learned what was wrong and I've learned what's right. With my work ethic, my family life, my views on politics, I bet that sounds like a symphony to God. But even if you had any of that or all of that dialed in a thousand times more than you do, do you know what it still sounds like to our perfect, exalted, majestic, transcendent God? Like a three-year-old banging on a piano. It doesn't sound like a symphony. The best human obedience can't begin to touch his own standard. And yet, though it sounds that way, God loves it. Have you been to a museum and seen some classic work of art? I've been to a few, and I've seen Rembrandts, and I've seen Monet's, and I've seen all those famous artists, some of which I can remember, a lot of which I can't. They were great, they were impressive. But as a parent, you know none of it was ever impressive as your own child scribbles. You didn't get near as excited about some masterpiece as you do your three-year-old's art because it's your child, and God is the same way. We imagine, man, I've done this now, and it's a symphony, and God says, I don't love it because it's so great. I just love it because it's you. I just love it because you're responding to my grace. The good news Drill it into your hearts and minds as you do not live on an achieve-fail paradigm with God. He's removed that. It's gone. Jesus has achieved. We have failed. That's all we need. Our achievement and our failure isn't what matters. Jesus' achievement, recognizing our failure and trusting in his achievement. You cannot add to the pleasure God has in you. He had pleasure in you before you were obedient. You can't add to that. You can't suddenly begin now to work that back up, to pay that off. He loved us when we were sinners, and he's not going to love us more when we're obedient. So we are free. Second, and more briefly, let's consider the next few points. Second, we fight to live free. We fight to live free. Go back with me to verse 5. Paul did not yield in submission even for a moment to those who said Titus had to be circumcised. By bringing Titus to Jerusalem, he was going to have, like we said, a powerful example of how the three inner disciples from Jesus' ministry, Peter, James, and John, receiving an unclean person. They met with him. I wondered if they ate with him. We're going to talk about that more in the paragraph we look at next week, how Peter refused to eat with Gentiles later. They had to be with Titus a man who was, according to the Old Testament law, unclean. Paul was going to have this powerful example of the inner three receiving him. Paul was willing to fight in the best possible sense to preserve the glorious truth of the gospel, which means we have to watch for threats to the gospel from the outside. Paul says, false brothers were secretly brought in. They wanted to limit the freedom that we have in Christ, the freedom from that bondage of our own obedience to gain God's approval. The message of free grace will always threaten some. The message of free grace will always mean some people who were in control are no longer in control, as if they ever really were. You see, we care about good doctrine because bad doctrine hurts people. It keeps them from freedom. But just having the right doctrine doesn't matter. We also have to trust it. We have to lean into it. We have to understand how it works out in our lives. Every generation has some place where the gospel at its core must be fought for and preserved. But that does not mean that we're repugnant and mean. Some people say social media has made us meaner 
I just think it's exposed what's already there. Too many Christians think being right gives them an excuse to be mean, and it doesn't. Look how Paul fought. He went privately to Peter, James, and John. If he had had Twitter, he didn't go there first to confront somebody. He went first just to them to seek to win them over. He wasn't repugnant and he wasn't mean, but he didn't back down. He fought not for a, so that even just for a minute the gospel could be compromised. He wasn't going to yield for a moment. He was watching for threats from the outside, and yes, so must we. But yes, I don't think it's too much of a stretch either to say we must watch for threats to this freedom in the gospel from the inside as well. What is it in your life, the secret corner of your heart, that still rises up and says, yes, but I need to do this or that? in order to get God's smile or build my credibility before somewhere or before someone else. We have to be ruthless in finding those areas of our life where we still seek to add on to what Jesus did by making a rule and following it that is beyond what God has said. I read this week that someone put it this way and I shared this quote with the Sunday school class this morning. The old hymn that says, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Do you know it? We could also sing it this way, and it would be true, and this is what Paul is saying here. My hope is built on nothing more than Jesus' blood or righteousness. My hope is built on nothing less, and it's built on nothing more. Do you hear the difference? Nothing less than Jesus' righteousness, but I don't need any more than that either. That is all I need before God. It's all I'm ever going to have before God, but it's all that I need as well. Many have said, rightly so, that we are works righteousness junkies. We are addicted to trying to earn our way to God. We're addicted to it. We have to be ruthless in finding out those areas in your life and weeding them out, repenting of them, and trusting God's free grace once again. So we're free, and therefore we fight. Third, therefore we partner. We partner with those different than us. Go back with me to verses 9 and 10. Peter, James, and John gave Paul the right hand of fellowship. That Paul and Barnabas could go to the Gentiles, Peter, James, and John to the circumcised, the Jews. They recognized that some had a calling, a message, a style, an approach fit for some groups. Others had a calling, a message, a style, an approach fit for others. And if you go through the book of Acts, you can see exactly how this worked out. Acts has long sermons in it. Some of these long sermons were to Jews, some were to Gentiles. And it's always the same gospel of grace alone, faith alone, and Jesus alone. But the ones to the Jews have a different emphasis and focus and tactic. The ones to the Gentiles have another because they were asking different questions. It's the same gospel, but it's presented and adapted to the audience. And that's exactly what these men are doing here. They are adapting their ministry without losing the gospel. They also seem to rejoice in each other's callings. You see, they could have been about empire building, but none of them are trying to control the other one. The uh, men from Jerusalem could have been jealous of Paul and his worldwide global ministry. Paul could have been jealous of them. I want to be a pillar. They're the pillars of the church. Why can't I be a pillar of the church? They said, no, we're going to follow God as he calls we're going to do our part. The others will do their part. And here's how I think this applies. If there's a church that doesn't completely agree with us, but has the gospel, we should be their biggest fan. We want them to do well. Yes, we might look and say, as best I can tell from God's word, there's a practice or an emphasis that's missing that we are trying to bring. But at the same time, I know that my church must be missing something. My branch of God's kingdom must be missing something, of course, because we're all flawed. No church has an absolute corner on everything. And so we love truth. We fight for truth. But at the same time, we recognize that God's kingdom and the call to reach the lost needs more than just our little branch. I love my branch of the church. I care about good doctrine. But I'm glad the whole church is not the PCA. I'm glad Clemson Press is not the only show in town. There can be different styles of music and means of outreach in these things, as long as it's the same essential 
gospel message. And the church must always be reforming and studying scripture and seeking to bring that about. But at the same time, we honor and rejoice in other branches of Christ's church and what God is doing through them. That doesn't mean that we won't have differences and even serious conversations and even various levels of partnership. Of course we will. But if the gospel message is as good as it is, and it is, then it's not only up to us. We need the rest of God's church. And lastly, we're free, so we fight, we partner, and we remember the poor. Chapter 2, verse 10. Chapter 2, verse 10 can sound like a, and now for something completely different moment to Christians of our day and age. It can sound like a non sequitur. Wait, they're arguing about how, how to have a right relationship with God, and oh, by the way, remember the poor. Oh, that's nice. But actually, it has everything to do with the very debate that they're having. You see, Paul and the apostles are coming to agreement about the glory of the gospel, how to have that, that right relationship with God. If you put Christians of all time in a room together, Christians like us who seem to see little connection between the gospel and ministry to the poor would be in the extreme minority. Because Christians throughout history have understood the concept, perhaps because they've been those more experienced with poverty than we have been. There's so much to say here, and we can't say it all, but let me just say this much to try to explain the connection. Why is this the one thing the apostles wanted Paul to do? Scripture says that physical poverty can be a reminder of our spiritual poverty. Our spiritual poverty is a reminder of God's riches given to us in Jesus. God's riches are a reminder that those very riches are given to us for our benefit, by grace alone. They're a reminder that God cared about us when we hated him, that he's been kind to us, and so we want to be kind to others even if they don't deserve it. Even if they don't deserve it. Our spiritual riches are a reminder that we can give without running out. God's never going to stop being generous with us. Our spiritual riches are a reminder of 2 Corinthians chapter 8, that the Lord Jesus, though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor so that you by his poverty might become rich. See, Jesus was rich. For our sake he became poor so that we might be rich, so that we can be generous. The physical poverty around us is naturally applied to when we trust the gospel. What if Christians were known for that? What if we were known for our love for the poor, that there were not a needy person among us and then it overflowed to those outside of the church? Could there be any better defense and demonstration of God's free grace than that? If receiving God's free grace actually changed how we used our resources for the sake of those who had less. You might know here at Clemson Press that our Mercy Ministry team cares about those kinds of things. Our goal is first to give to our church members who are in need and then to overflow to those in need in all of the area around us, to care for the widows and the orphans through adoption and foster care. And we can't do it all alone, so we need partners. If you go to our website and go to the Ministries tab and click on Mercy, you'll see the organizations that we're privileged to partner with. If the Lord leads, you can give there to our efforts to do those kinds of things. If you want to get more involved, you can go see Sherry Bull. Her contact information is there on the website. You can see one of our deacons. You can get involved in actually doing these things physically through gifts and through service. You see, one thing I love about this church is it understands and has been changed by the gospel and has been doing these kinds of things. And our dream and our prayer is that it would understand and trust the gospel even more and because of that, be able by God's grace to do yet even more of those kinds of things. Because you see, the gospel is better than we think. Grace is better than we can ever know. So even this week, when that performance mindset rears up in your head and your heart, Fight it with the truth. When you think God is ready to kick you out because you failed again, know he's not surprised. Know he is calling you to more, but not to gain his approval, but because you already have it. Let's pray. Father, by your grace alone, we can hear and trust and be changed. So we pray that you would do that. We pray that you would all give us a new sense, a deeper sense, maybe than we've ever had. We continually need it of how good and gracious and free your offer of salvation is. 
how great your love is. Father, may we continually be changed by the gospel. And may we never yield a moment, Father, when it comes to preserving that truth, not for the sake of our tribe or our control, but for the sake of your glory and of people who need to know that they can be free. Teach us, Father, what all this means in all of our lives, even this week. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue to worship. Let's respond. Let's stand and sing Living Hope.
Thank you all once again for joining us this morning, for worshiping, whether here in the room or online. Uh, if you are new, we'd love to get to know you and help you get connected to what's going on here. If you would like, you can go to our website to clemsonpres.org slash contact. You can sign up there for all of our emails and newsletters and find out what's going on. If you want to meet someone this morning, I'll be down here in the front. There'll be folks in the lobby at the booth that would love to meet you there as well. Or lastly, take that contact card from the folder there on the chair in front of you, fill that out, and drop it in one of the offering boxes as you leave, and we'd be honored to get in touch with you then. But we go this morning, lastly, with God's blessing and with his smile because of what Jesus has done. So let's lift up our hands and receive it. Peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace.